What's this? Comic book collector host Frank Gorshin held hostage by the evil Neville. Now that I've cashed you, you'll never make it to the taping of Comic Book Collector. But I gotta! Now that I've stopped you, no one will learn about comic books. They'll all be mine. If there was only some way... Thank goodness, young John Crane is reading of Frank's predicament. With a wish and a wisp, he transforms himself and plunges into the story to become... Oh no! Captain Connor! You're finished, Neville. When will you learn that comics are for everyone? You can't do this to me. With the evil Neville stopped, Captain Comic whisks Frank to the taping of Comic Book Collector. Hi, I'm Frank Gorsh, and this is Comic Book Collector. You know, comic book collecting today is perhaps the most exciting hobby around. That's right. At one time, comic books were thought of as kid stuff, but today the comic book has grown up. Certainly Hollywood has always seen the comic book superhero as a big box office attraction, from the 1930 movie serials to the blockbuster mega hits of Batman, Superman, Dick Tracy. People flock to see their heroes on the big screen. And each week, TV viewers tune into Superman, Wonder Woman, and of course, Batman, where yours truly got a chance to portray his arch-villain, the Riddler. <laughs> it's obvious, the comic book format has entertained readers and audiences for more than 60 years. Along with baseball and jazz, the comic book is truly Americana. So where did it all begin? The year was 1897. McKinley was in the White House. The diesel engine was invented, and William Randolph Hearst's New York American newspaper published Richard Outcult's The Yellow Kid for the first time. This hardcover collection of reprints of Outcult's 1896 comic strips, which appeared in the New York World newspaper, is recognized as the earliest comic book. From 1899 to 1917, over 70 hardcover books containing reprints of popular Sunday newspaper comic strips were published. Popular strips such as Buster Brown, Foxy Grandpa, Cats and Jammer Kids, Little Nemo, Mutt and Jeff, Barney Google, Joe Palooka, and Little Orphan Annie made up these collections. In 1917, the Saulfield Publishing Company was the first to use the term comic book. The book featured reprints of Clancy the Cop strips, and it actually entitled itself Comic Book. In 1922, MB Publishing issued the first monthly comic, which featured one strip per issue. It was called Comic Monthly. Seven years later, George Delacorte of Dell Publishing produced the first comic books that featured original strips. The first of these, entitled The Funnies, failed to gain acceptance. One of the main reasons may have been that the comic books sold in traditional newspaper size and the public felt as though they were buying an incomplete newspaper. Also available at the time was The Big Little Book, published by Whitman Publishing Company. The first issue contained The Adventures of Dick Tracy. The books were three to four hundred pages in length. In 1933, an idea struck Eastern Color Printing Company of Waterbury, Connecticut. This idea was to revolutionize the comic book. The printers at Eastern Color had done some experimenting and found that they could reduce the size of a comic book to 8 by 11 inches by taking a newspaper funny section and laying it horizontally so the strips were side by side. With this new method of printing comic books, Eastern executive Harry Wildenberg obtained newspaper reprints of strips such as Mutt and Jeff, Hairbreath Harry, and Joe Palooka as contents for his new comics. His idea was to convince manufacturers to give them away as premiums. This method of advertising had been very successful throughout the previous decades with the tobacco company's use of baseball cards as premiums. Comic book salesman extraordinaire Max C. Gaines sold 10,000 comic books to Procter & Gamble, who in turn issued them as coupon giveaways. This first modern comic was called Funnies on Parade. With the realization that comic books were a hit, Eastern Color and Dell Publishing issued the first comic book that retailed to the public on newsstands. The first of these was 
Famous Funnies Series 1. It sold for 10 cents and remained a popular comic book for years to come. The 10 cent cover price remained the standard for the next 25 years. Look, Pilgrim's up in the sky. It's a bird. Oh, wait a second. If my memory serves me correctly, I believe that's a plane. Wait a second. You're both wrong with what I tell you. That's my pal, Superman. Hey, maybe now I'll get some respect. How do you like that? A bird or a plane? That's Superman. What do you say, pal? Superman debuted in Action Comics number one. It was written by Jerry Siegel and drawn by Joe Shuster. The Man of Steel's appearance on the cover truly ignited what's referred to as the golden age of comics. No other comic book has been more important than this one, and certainly no other superhero has been more imitated or inspiring than Superman. A year later, DC's Detective Comics number 27 debuted The Batman. It was written by Bill Finger and illustrated by Bob Kane. Well, one of these 1939 comic books in mint condition just recently sold for $135,000. Kane, a young illustrator working for DC, was inspired by the success of the Superman character. At the time, Kane was earning $35 a week, while at the same time, Siegel and Schuster were earning $800 a piece for their work on Superman. As legend has it, Kane worked up the Batman character over a weekend. Influenced by Da Vinci's flying machine and the film The Bat Whispers, Kane created the original Batman. Although Superman and Batman shared a huge financial success, their personalities as superheroes were as different as day and night. Superman and Batman weren't the only attractions in their comic books. The villains, sidekicks, and spin-offs were as popular with readers as the superheroes themselves. That's right. Wait till you get a load of this. <laughs> In 1964, a gentleman had nothing to do on a long airplane flight, so he picked up a copy of Batman and was hooked. His name, William Dozier, the eventual producer and narrator of the 1966 Batman TV series. 
1940, the original comic books surpassed the Sunday reprints in newsstand sales. Publishers like Fawcett, Centaur, Fox Features, and Harry A. Chesler syndicates, among others, began introducing titles featuring science fiction, fantasy, war, and animals. It was evident that the comic book market was booming and readers were embracing these new characters as well as the new and exciting superheroes. Max C. Gaines left DC Comics in 1945 and opened up his own company, EC, which began an unsuccessful run of comic books entitled Picture Stories from the Bible and Stories from American History. At the time, EC stood for Educational Comics, which by 1947 was changed to Entertaining Comics by Max C. Gaines' son, William, who was now running the show. When I was a kid, I read science fiction pulps and horror pulps, and they were my favorite reading. So basically, I was putting into comic books the same kind of stuff that I had read as a kid. And uh, since no one had done quite the same thing in comics before, although it was old stuff in pulps, uh, my, my comics were unique for a while, so everybody imitated them. We had a tremendously talented staff. The stories were good. The artists were the best in the field, and uh, we just put out very good comics. Today, many collectors agree that William Gaines' EC comics are the finest examples of the comic book form. With dramatic illustrations, provocative storylines and titles, and cutting-edge humor, EC's unparalleled standards attracted all the top artists. Archie Comics was originally known as MLJ Magazine. The initials came from its founders, Morris Coyne, Louis Cybercleet, and John Goldwaters. Established in 1939 with the help from syndicator Harry A. Chesler, they published the first line of comic books. One of the earliest titles was called Pep. And, as Victor Garlick tells us, Archie is still alive and well in Riverdale, USA. John Goldwater, was his. he was one of the founders of the company, and uh, he had this idea to... Uh, for a teenage character and he had his artist who was working in the art department at the time he had a few artists working there uh, and he had them all do likenesses of this what he thought this teenage character should look like and Bob Montana was the first artist to do the likeness of Archie and so uh, they put the first story of Archie and Pep and it really took off there was a very big response to it it was during the war and uh, there was a lot of attention drawn to it because of that tie-in with home and, you know, a lot of soldiers being away overseas and the, the whole family unit. And so Archie became very popular. They published the first book in 42 and the rest is uh, history. He was not a superhero and he was very believable and that's why Archie's so popular today. He's always remained contemporary with the times and it's not like he's stood still. I mean, you read Archie's stories now, they're certainly a lot different than they were back in the 40s. Uh, quite recently, we, uh, we added quite a few new titles to the list. Uh, one of our most successful ones being Veronica, uh, the Veronica title. And in each, each uh, issue, she travels to a different place. So the first one, she traveled with Veronica in Paris, and with Veronica in Germany, Veronica in Mexico. Now we are working on an issue now where Veronica goes to Russia. In 1954, Dr. Frederick Wortham published a book called The Seduction of the Innocent. This book cited comic books as a direct link to juvenile delinquency. The book created such an uproar that a Senate subcommittee was formed to investigate the allegations. He was a psychiatrist who did believe that comics caused juvenile delinquency. He made a good, he made a good living believing this for a long time, testifying at different 
trials of kids that got in trouble and saying they got in trouble because they read comics. The uh, subcommittee was attempting to blame comics for juvenile delinquency uh, on the theory that every juvenile delinquent had read comics. They had also eaten ice cream, but somehow that, that, didn't, that didn't mean anything. In order to avoid further government intervention, comic book publishers created the Comic Code Authority to maintain their own standards. of DC's The Flash, a 1940s superhero, is cited as launching what is referred to as the Silver Age. Perhaps the best known name associated with comic books, besides the superheroes themselves, is Marvel publisher Stan Lee. He started writing for Marvel in the 1940s, and by the 1960s, Stan Lee had brought Marvel to the forefront of the comic book world. With the debut of the Fantastic Four, Marvel quickly had the hottest selling comic book of the 60s. Marvel's working artists Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, along with Stan Lee, created some of the most dynamic superheroes that are as popular today as when they debuted. Everybody knows Jerry Lewis, Lucille Ball, and the Three Stooges from the world of Hollywood. But did you know they all have appeared in comic books?
In the 1980s, the newsstand was no longer the dominant place to purchase comics. Comic book publishers began to recognize the collector's market and the significance of the comic book store. With collectors turning to their comic book shop to buy new issues, a new trend appeared. The independent comic book boom took hold. Though not polished in design, these mostly black and white issues dealt with strong subject matters and outrageous characters. This new breed of radical comics was reminiscent of the underground comics of the 60s. Many independents ignored the comic code, and it seemed as if everyone was publishing a comic book. The major comic publishers had taken notice of the more graphic comic books and their popularity. Incorporating this new art form and satisfying the collector's thirst for more mature subject matter, the graphic novel evolved. Certainly, comic books had changed. Characters were experiencing more personal problems and their vulnerabilities were exposed as they became more believable to the reader. The advent of the graphic novel allowed the subject matter and the characters to be explored to their limits. The most influential of the graphic novels are The Dark Knight by Frank Miller, which was an inspiration for the movie Batman, DC's Watchmen, Arkham Asylum, as well as Faust and Stray Toasters. Naturally, the price tags on these graphic novels are considerably higher than the standard comic book due to the superior quality of the illustrations, printing process, and paper stock. Graphic novels often stray from the classic comic book format. Panels are arranged in unconventional layouts. Characters and storylines often appear in abstract form, such as the case with Art Spiegelman's highly acclaimed Mouse. It's about what happened to my father and mother which is they were Jews in Eastern Europe during the Hitler years, and they got caught up in the entire maelstrom, including the concentration camps. Uh, it's in the form of a comics, a comic book, uh, in the form of my father relating to me what happened to, to him and my mother, and the characters in the book are portrayed with animal heads. It's a comic book for adults. Many of today's illustrators are learning the craft of the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Comic book illustrating is taught by some of the greatest comic book artists of all time there. Eisner, Kirby, and DC's Joe Orlando among SBA's faculty. Drawing can be learned. Uh, learned as much, uh, as easily as you learn how to write. People who say I can't draw a straight line, um, uh, right on track, they shouldn't be drawing straight lines. Given the, uh, the, the necessary essentials, most people can learn how to draw. One of the most important things about being a collector is knowing how to take care of your comics. The comic book paper contains acid, which is a residual effect of the manufacturing process. This accelerates the aging process. Although you can't stop the aging process, here are some products that help slow it down. You've probably seen comic books in plastic bags at comic stores and conventions. These sleeves are expressly designed for comic book storage. Two of the most popular are polypropylene and mylar bags manufactured by DuPont. You should get into the habit of changing the sleeves every two to three years for maximum protection. It's also a good idea to use acid-free backing boards. These prevent your comics from creasing and bending while in storage. Collectors should keep their collections in storage boxes. Boxes free of acid are also available to collectors. By following these steps, you can assure yourself a long-lasting collection. You all know Captain America, the Incredible Hulk, and the Mighty Thor. But 1967 Marvel's not brand X number three showed them in a slightly different way. For it was now Charlie America, the Incredible Bulk, and the Mighty Thor fighting crime. The condition of a comic book is vitally important in determining its value. The following is a list to help you determine the various conditions.
Atomic Buyer's Guide is published weekly by Krause Publications of Iola, Wisconsin. It'll help you find out the value of comic books, how to buy and sell by mail, and what you need to know to keep abreast of everything happening in the hobby. You'll be able to find the latest issue at your local comic book store. Along with Krause, there are other comic book guides and catalogs that range in subject and can satisfy the beginner or advanced collector. Krause also publishes a price guide. And along with Overstreet's official comic book price guide, you'll be able to determine the value of every comic book ever made. Comics are listed by year and title and are priced according to its condition. But remember, if you're selling your comic books, expect dealers to offer a lower price than listed. One of the best places to browse around and buy new and old comics is your local comic book store. Comic stores afford collectors a chance to develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the dealer. Comics uh, are no longer for kids. It's taken a tremendous turn for, uh, for adults. Uh, it's uh, a little more explicit, it's more graphic, and uh, it's, uh, uh, as I say, far more adult. The themes are adult, so that uh, um, you don't get uh, the average uh, kid who comes in here to buy a comic book. We've had an influx of tremendous publicity from the movies, from the entertainment world, uh, from the Superman movies, obviously. I mean, it's nonsensical to even mention the Batman movie. That's going to be at least three to five movies. You know, what you got going on there is, is a tremendous influx of that. So you have people coming in the store who would never dream of buying a comic book. Just as I want Batman. <laughs> uh, uh, and the other thing is, is it has become an investment item, which has drawn in a tremendous amount of new people into the field. And that, in turn, has caused comic prices to rise, because comics that you couldn't sell 20 years ago, you can't find today. Parents buy comics for their kids, parents buy comics for themselves. We have lawyers, we have doctors who look at it as an investment. Uh, comics can increase in value very quickly. and. Uh, people want to capitalize on that. It's it's like um, stocks. Uh, they want to they want to get in. They want to get the the popular titles. They want to ask me what's going to go up next month. What's going to be of value? And that's what we do. We try to guide the the people who are into it for investor into the books that are going to increase in value. But then there's a whole other realm of the hardcore fan who's going to who's been buying for 20 years or 15 years, and they love the stories. They love the art. And it's like a, it's a marriage of between the two types of collectors. Well, there's so many comics to collect. I would say the first thing is find something you like, find something you really appreciate more than I mean, more than the 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 intrinsic value, the the, the monetary value of a comic. The personal value is, is is a lot of it. I I mean I couldn't collect every single comic in the world, but there are a few titles that I collect religiously. Um, I'd say find a comic that you really like, make it not something that you couldn't collect everything of, make it uh, a feasible goal, and uh, and start collecting back issues, collect all the current issues, of course, but see if you can uh, get a whole series together. This is a place you can come to all the time. The, the schedule of new books is pretty consistent. Uh, in fact, the, the schedule of any particular book is fairly consistent, especially from the major companies. And this will allow you the the amount of copies that a uh, store will carry will usually allow you to be sure you get a copy. And many stores o offer a subscription service, whereas you can give them a list of the books that you collect, and uh, they will pull them for you. So you can come in three, four, five days later. How do you start to collect anything? All right you develop an interest in it and then you want to pursue the interest all across the country collectors also look forward to weekend conventions collectors can find almost every comic ever made at these cons you'll find the dealers specialize in certain categories of comics you usually get your best buys at these shows but remember to shop around because many dealers carry the same stock and prices may vary 
At these shows, you'll also have a chance to meet some of the top illustrators and publishers and celebrities who portrayed comic book characters. We're longtime uh, readers of comics, and we enjoy the work that the professionals in the field are doing. And this is a chance, really, for fans of comics and readers to get together with each other and also to meet some of their uh, favorites. And that's the idea behind the convention. It's a social event, also a business event in a certain sense, but uh, more or less for everyone to get together and celebrate their love of comics. And we've been doing this for many years. And as fans ourselves, it's really a pleasure to see all the people turn out to enjoy the show with us. Well, thanks for looking and listening. For the comic book collector, I'm Frank Gorshin. Also available in the collector series, Baseball Card Collector, hosted by Mel Allen. <laughs>